Hello. Yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, I know I'm not supposed to ask that. But I thought this year, Scala Lovely Folks from Scala.io invited me to give my first keynote ever. And it's the first thing in the morning. People are still arriving. Come on in. Welcome. Someone came with their bag straight from train, I guess. And everyone overwhelmed from yesterday workshops or maybe hangover. Everyone likes wine and we're in France, right? So I thought it would be fun to start upside down and ask questions. But if you do have a question, <laughs> please go ahead and ask them online. I created a Q&A session for you so you can scan that. It's a real honor to be asked to present in front of you. And it's also a particular pleasure to share this stage with so many beautiful minds of our community. And I want to mention that this conference this year opened up their hearts by inviting diverse speakers, me and Daniela. Daniela, where you are, yeah. So I want you to give a round of applause for the conference and Daniela. Yes, yeah, so first and foremost, welcome everyone to Scala.io 2019. And I hope by the end of this talk, you will be feeling inspired, motivated, and ready for two days of the best talks, best speakers, and best technical discussions you can find anywhere in the world. Does that sound okay to you? <laughs> so let's work a little bit on participation. I thought, as I said, I'm doing things backwards. So not only I started with the questions, but also I'm going to ask them and you're going to answer them. If you are up for this, I will count three, two, one, and you shout yes. So are you up for this? Three, two, one. Yes. Louder. <laughs> three, two, one. Yes. Cool. Let's train. One plus zero equals three, two, one. one. <laughs> Come on, one plus one equals three, two, one. Yeah. It's zero, guys. Come on. <laughs> well, when I was asked uh, to give this keynote, I have to admit I took a long time for consideration because I was afraid that I wouldn't know what to talk about. And then I thought maybe I should talk about my fear. And then the thing was that I was petrified to talk about my fear. There are a lot of keynotes about the imposter syndrome. And I was thinking, yeah, a lot of things resonated with me. I found something that I've learned along my way there, but I couldn't boil them because I couldn't remember them well enough. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about my life and my trouble that I've been through. I'm a troublemaker. And thank you for my amazing cheerleaders for being here. <laughs> it's still terrifying for me, but let's go. So in December of 2016, I moved to the United States seeking for the American dream. But I didn't speak English. So while I was flying there and taking these pictures, having no idea I would ever show them publicly, some of them are ridiculous, <laughs> you know, these transatlantic flights, I was thinking about my first technical interview in English. You know, you all know how difficult it is to go to technical interviews rounds and rounds of questions, algorithms, whiteboarding. You are petrified. Your hands are shaking. They're sweating. You're thinking, oh my God, I cannot fail. My whole life probably depends on that. All of that, but in a foreign language. 
yes, that's, that's quite difficult. I was struggling with that. And then I thought, uh, maybe I should come up with a plan how I'm going to nail it. Because probably there is a way to talk less, but still look like I'm smart. Right? So I thought, what if I will create a list of questions and while I'm asking them and my interviewer enjoying answering them, everyone loves talk about themselves, right? While they enjoy, I can just pretend I am smart <laughs> and can speak English very well. Yes, but before I'm giving you advices on how to nail this and talk about questions, I want to show you one of my tweets. I was so proud, so thankful, and so grateful that Scala.io invited me that I wrote this tweet, probably one of the most important tweets in my career so far. And as you can see, my friends, I still cannot spell the word grateful. <laughs> and it was already too late when I realized that. Someone retweeted that, someone liked that, and I couldn't remove that. And I was like, oh, damn it, how that happened? And, you know, the reason I'm showing this is that even though I was sad and upset at the beginning, then I thought, I don't have to be perfect. And you don't have to be perfect either. Just try to improve your language, but your thought, your passion, your professionalism is more important than the language. So you still can nail it. Just be a little bit brave. I do that, at least. So back to my plan. I decided to Google. Maybe someone already did that before me, right? Yes. So it turns out that 20 years ago, Joel Spolsky uh, did that task to evaluate his own system or create the questions when you're an interviewer. Um, and it's quite old. It's been 20 years, and questions like, do you use source control do not make a lot of sense right now. Does everyone use source control? Three, two, one. Yes. <laughs> I'm proud of you. That's, that's great. So I thought, OK, I need to update that, preview that, add something from my personal experience. And of course, I started with technical details. We all software engineer, we love this stuff, right? So I think here, my focus was on the new technologies and new things that you're bringing uh, to your stack. It's interesting how that company, your new company, is going to adopt technologies. You want to know if I'm bringing something super fancy and functional or I'm writing my own library, how will they adopt that, right? So you can ask questions about that even during interview. I remember one story when I was at technical interview in Russia. I worked as a Java developer. Don't say anyone, but <laughs> I was Java developer. And it was around uh, the time when Java 1.8 came out. So, and they've got this stream, streams API, new API. So you could filter, map, flat map, do whatever you want on collections. Immutable, cool stuff. Now I'm Scala developer, you see. So, and during the interview, the interviewer gave me a problem. It's a graph algorithm, something. And I started to write that. But while I was writing that, I asked him if he was familiar with that new API. And it turns out he wasn't. So I started to describe that this is how you can traverse through collection. This is what you, you can do. And I talked about passing functions inside functions. And that idea just struck him. That was a blast for the guy. So he was like, oh my God, yeah, 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 I know. You can put a filter here and you can put a condition inside. So, and I was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. So he solved the problem himself without <laughs> noticing that. <laughs> that, that. That's what question can do. So do not hesitate. Your interview should be a collaboration between you and the interviewer. 
So you can, you can just try to see how you're going to work together, whether they're passionate about the same thing or not. For now, for example, for Scala people, it makes sense to ask about moving to Scala 213. Because even though they uh, promise that it's not painful, it is, right? Yeah. So, have you moved to Scala 213 already? Three, two, one. No. <laughs> We're inconsistent. So people who moved, they know all that pain. People who didn't, who have not yet, will know. But that's one part. Another part, have you tried to use Dottie? Three, two, one. Yes. Cool. Have you tried to compile your project to Dottie? Yes. <laughs> exactly. But it brings so many things, new types. Maybe you will remove a lot of boilerplate from your code. And as earlier you think about that, as it is better for your project. And probably when you are looking for a new job, you want to know where they are in state of moving to Doty, whether they think about that or not. Is it interesting for them? Another part is process, working schedule, on-call rotations. Top-notch companies do not torture their developers with endless, infinite on-call rotations. Or maybe Amazon does during Black Friday week. But anyway, you want to know in advance how your working schedule looks how they're going to measure your performance. I have a friend, he's a functional developer, and he's so fascinated about teaching people. And he joined a company and started to teach people how to do things in a functional way. But it turns out that even though his peers were excited about him and about the work he's doing for managers, his work wasn't that valuable because it wasn't bringing new business logic but it, it was just making a system maintainable and stable and do it right way. But how do you explain that to manager? Is there a way to put objectives and do that officially? Or are you going to be separated from the team? So these are all important questions. Another topic is education and improvement. We're here at a conference. Isn't it interesting whether your uh, potential employer will pay for that or not? Will you be recognized if you are doing, if you are a speaker at a conference? Or are you going to go to trainings for, uh, and a uh, company will sponsor you for that? This is very important. I cannot stress enough how important that, along with the personal branding. When I joined 47 Degrees, I joined that because of the people, because I knew their personal brands. I didn't join that because it was a fancy consulting company, whatever, or because of the name. I joined them because of the people. And this is for every company. It's your biggest assets, your talents, your people. And for clients, they, if, if your people have their uh, personal brands. Your clients will know their capabilities. They will more likely use you if you have people who are known in the community. This and a lot of other questions I posted in my uh, blog post. It has like over 100 really comprehensive list of questions, including like things like conflicts, uh, public image of a company, and what not. So if you're interested, please check it out. I also ran a poll on Twitter and asked people how many questions they asked during interviews. So as you can see, 14% of people do not ask questions at all. Well, with 10%, I hope that my keynote and uh, my blog post can help people uh, to, oh, actually, let, let's check. Do, do, do we have the same, are, the, are there any people who do not ask questions at all here? Oh, Valentin. <laughs> yes, you do not. Yeah, until now, now you know. But there is 4%, they, they think it's useless. 
I bet they don't ask for directions while driving. Yeah, I know where I'm going. 68% ask one to five questions. But you know, uh, at Starbucks, they ask more questions. Flat white, decaf, <laughs> milk, almond milk, mousse, whatever. And the others ask more questions. Sometimes people complain that they don't have enough time. But as I said before, you should ask questions while you're interviewing. Because I do believe that interview is a two-way process. They're interviewing you, and you're interviewing a company. You want to know whether you're additive, whether you fit for their culture or not. Because it's missed for both. If you join a company where you are not happy, it's missed for both. They spent time, hired you, started a process, onboarding, and then all of a sudden, in three weeks, you are leaving. That's not cool. I'm a very annoying candidate, by the way. Yes. Uh, before I accept the offer, I always was f ask for one more interview. And companies usually shocked because they don't understand that. But what I'm trying to see is whether I get along good with uh, at least one member of the team or not. How we can contact, communicate. So I do encourage you to ask a lot of questions and don't hesitate. So let's, the end of the story. So I came to my first interview in the United States and I remember that vividly because I came trying to look cool. I came and I said, hello, I'm Oli, today is my birthday. So it really was my birthday. I have no idea why I said that, <laughs> but it really was. So I said, it's my birthday. I have a list of questions. If I look stupid, you ask something different. <laughs> and I got the job. <laughs> yes. So I do believe every one of you can repeat the same. I do believe in it. So let's turn around and think about the, if you are interviewer. So Joel Spolsky said, do whatever you want, but make the candidate write code. Because that's the most important part. You want to know whether they produce code or not, whether it's good or not. But we're not going to talk about technical details right now because it should be tailored for your project. You should ask what is important for your project, not in general. Like, in general, questions are good too, but that's just an introduction. So there are don'ts and there are do's. What questions do you ask, what you don't? So, let's think. And then I'm going to count three to one, and you're going to shout the answer. So we have a function, and it prints something. Are you ready? So what is the result of execu executing the following code? Three, two, one. <laughs> We're inconsistent. So it's B. It's B. But if you don't know that, that's OK, because you probably do not use return. You're a functional programming programmer. You do not use return, so you don't know what it does, which is good. But I just wanted to uh, demonstrate that questions like this, this is from Scala Puzzler's book. Uh, they are funny, but probably it doesn't make sense to confuse your candidate with questions like that, because they will start to think they are not well prepared. But they're just functional programmers. They have no idea about that. So do not ask lazy questions, like tell me about yourself. Even this morning, I've met a woman during breakfast, and she said that she gave an interview yesterday, and they asked, tell me about yourself. And she started to shake, and she forgot even to name one of the companies she worked, and everything. <laughs> <laughs> 
but at interview, you do have a CV. So usually I read the CV and I point something that it's interested me and I would ask like very specific question about the particular experience that the person had or about their university project. So don't be lazy. Or self-serving question, tell what you know about my company. Yeah, I work for a small company. Yeah, 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 you came from Java. You probably have no idea about 47 degrees, but tell me. <laughs> so instead of starting your conversation and showing the important points that your company uh, cares about, you're, sometimes people ask a very generic question and that uh, confuses the candidate, so do not do that. And don't go too personal. You know, I've been asked, are those dreadlocks? Oh, really? Or questions like, are you married? Are you pregnant or going to be pregnant? <laughs> Gosh, yes, I was interviewed for a startup and they had a hard deadline and they were like, you don't be pregnant. <laughs> 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 well, right? <laughs> so if you want to say something about how family friendly your company is, you just can say that. You can always bring plus one to our company events. Or it's okay to ask about hobbies. If you have a football team or chess team or board games, I love board games. We played a lot of board games at Expedia and that was enjoyable. That's how I've learned English. Yes, through games. I like social games like Mafia, everyone sleeps, yeah. So, Voltaire said, judge a man by his question rather than his answer. So this is the part where we're going to talk about do's. What questions to ask? Again, we're not talking about technical details, but about questions that will result in question. So what questions would you ask if you were interviewing someone for a similar position? You could ask that to interviewee and you would know whether they understand what your project does or not. Where do they put emphasis? On a tech stack or on something different? That's interesting how people see that from outside. How deep or how not deep they understand. Another question could be, what questions shall I ask you to let you to show you your full potential? I love this question, especially with new, graduate, new grads, because they don't have enough experience and that's probably for them an opportunity to show what they're passionate about. Maybe they have something else, not only programming, but another passion. And that's always interesting to learn. Another good idea is to get a feedback to know what questions work from, from those that you asked, right? Or if we go into uh, more technical questions, then uh, give them stack trace or log statement and let them ask questions on stack overflow. So you want to make sure that the question makes sense. You want to make sure that they ask that in a secure way. So if you happen to have password in your log statement, <laughs> you, you want them to remove, or AWS key, whatever. You want that to be removed, you want the stack trace to like, remove class names or package names and things like that. And it's also interesting that it happened to me a lot of times when I was trying to ask questions online and you try to remove all unnecessary information and all of a sudden you have three lines of code and you know the answer. Because now it's observable, you can see everything. In any case, I want you, next time you're doing an interview, I want you to think about the candidate and let them ask questions. Let curl, let them collaborate with you like you were peers already to see how comfortable or not comfortable 
it is to work with this person. Maybe help them to solve the problem, as I showed before. So another, how are we doing on, on time? Good. Another thing that I want to talk about is collaboration. So from the outside world, it might seem that all we're doing is sitting on our chair and typing something on a keyboard. But in fact, we're a very social profession. We're collaborating a lot. We're doing that during PR reviews, some analysis, and networking. So let's start with the feedback, how questions can help. So giving a critique happens when you're doing PR reviews, architectural discussions, design reviews. And it's very important part because if you care about the outcome, about the result of your project, you should participate in the critique, in the feedback, because that's how team players, team player work. I have a question for you. Do you feel confident when you join a new company? Three, two, one. Yes. Wow. I don't feel like that at all. At all. I feel like, oh my God, why, why did I do that? Why did I challenge myself again? Oh my God, I get a, I better go back to my old company and feel like I'm a star there. So I want to tell you a story about my friend. Uh, let's call her Dorothy. Or well, let's use her nickname, Dottie. <laughs> so, uh, Dottie is a Python developer. <laughs> Dottie is a Python 3 developer. <laughs> and she joined her first company af right after the university. And she was given a task to build a pipeline. And in similar uh, pipelines, they use like different kind of assemblers. So she knew that she would be uh, using assembler at her work anyway. And while she was um, studying at university, she knew that they had uh, a project assembler at the university, the guys were building, and that was very fancy university. You know, it was led by uh, some, by some uh, Nobel Prize winner. So she knew, oh my God, these guys are so smart and they have high standards, and that assembler must be the best thing in the world, so I have to use this one. So she created the PR, and her reviewer said, oh, you know, uh, use X instead. And she was like, that's her first job, and she's new, one of the first things that she's doing. And when we're in a new place, we tend to be obedient. We tend to create as less inconvenience as possible. We're trying to be to say yes to everything, okay to everything, without critical thinking, because we're just not confident enough yet. So she started to build her pipeline using that assembler that she was recommended. But then she ran into the issues and then other issues, and she started wondering, uh, why did they say that? And it took her a while, Dottie, <laughs> to uh, gain a courage to ask why. And it turns out that the reason was, like, we always use that. My favorite, my favorite reason, historical reasons, my favorite thing. And uh, she decided to ask what metrics uh, should she use to choose the right assembler? And she ended up with the third one. Neither the one that she uh, initially sought off, neither the one that she was recommended. The third one was the best choice. And that shows us two examples of bad critique. The first one, when she was criticizing her own thing, is preferential thinking. When you have a preference, when you went to that university, you knew this guy, oh my God, he's writing fantastic open source, or it can be negative too. Do not use this library, I don't like its maintainer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And it's not only unhelpful, because it has nothing to do with the goal of the project, you're not thinking about that, but it's also toxic, because the team, especially if it comes from someone who is in a position of approval, like team leader, uh, the team tends to think consciously or unconsciously. We all do that. We try to satisfy someone who has a good reputation. Uh, we try to satisfy their preferences, even if they are going in the wrong direction, not the, where projects or user goals are. So it's crucial. Another one is incomplete. So she's been told to use a particular library, but there were no explanation of why. So we should think what we are saying and how we, and why we are saying that. Because why behind it will give more information to the recipient and they can, up, can come up with a better solution. So things like, what the F is this? is incomplete because there is no why behind that. But if you are yourself as, a, um, as the giver of review, sometimes, I don't know, we're reacting like that. We, we just don't understand. That doesn't make sense. But I usually uh, take a pause, calm down, and then I'm thinking, why am I reacting like that? What's in there that bothers me? And usually I'm grabbing my assumptions together and I just ask whether they are accurate or not. And selfish or self-promotion. So I remember one episode that happened recently in our community. Uh, it was when um, significant white space was announced and my friend Dottie was happy but not that many members of our community were. And there were a lot of criticism like that they shouldn't have designed that like that, or I would be do doing that better. And this is not helpful either because you just bring in, they just bring in attention to themselves, but they do not help the situation. Also, it's not necessarily malicious to do so, to give this like selfish, uh, feedback, but it often comes because uh, people do not understand, they do not have the same constraints in their head, and they just don't, uh, they didn't go through the same way as the language designers, so it's just hard for them to reason. And we should hold this back. What about good critic? Lead with the question. Just ask questions. Can you tell me more about your choice? What other options did you consider? Why did you choose that approach? Where, were there any constraints or influencers? That will show the recipient that you are caring not only about the work that they, they've done, but also the way they are thinking. So that would be more engaging for you and for the recipient. And as I said, we're collaborating. So we should care about having a dialogue instead of just putting these comments and thinking that they will silently fix everything. Ask more questions. So let's talk about analysis. COE stands for correction of errors. Have you ever pushed back into production? Three, two, one. Yes. Me too! <laughs> I'm so proud of a couple big incidents I created <laughs> at Expedia. Yeah, you know, um, it was like half a year after that my first interview uh, when I joined Expedia and I decided to uh, deploy some code. It was innocent looking. Yeah, and it was uh, Friday during lunch. And I was like, yeah, one line of code, why not? What can happen? What can go wrong? 
Well, I deployed the code and I was monitoring because I'm serious. I have a reputation of a good developer. I always monitor my code, even if, though it's one line, but still. So I was sitting there, you know, lazily checking graphs. And then all of a sudden, money graph and CPU graph started to go different directions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, probably it's a network lag. <laughs> Metrics cannot be like that. <laughs> they cannot, but no. So after like 30 seconds or a minute, I realized that something went really, really bad. And all, it's an open space office, like a big one, like this room. And every phone started to ring. <laughs> yes, and I was like, I stood up over my desk, looked at that empty space because it's Friday during lunch. No one is, there. and I need someone to roll it back because we have a process. You need someone to accept your uh, rolling back changes. And I, I was like speechless. My heart was just like, I don't know, maybe 200 bits. And I was like, oh my, what? And then I spotted someone in the different cor corners. So I rushed to them and they were eating their sandwich. And I was like, oh my God, oh, cannot say anything, like literally anything. And then I was like, go there, I'll show you. Look at that, look at this, panic, panic. And then he was like, okay, 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 we can roll it back. So we started to roll it back and it required to put one parameter, the name of the host, where are you going to um, do the, where you were rolling back. And it was a regex, for the God's sake. You are having a production issue, you need to think about regex. Okay, so it should be easy, it's all servers, right? So uh, we left it blank, tried to roll back. It said successful, but nothing happened. And I was like, oh, probably it's not my code then. Someone else deployed someone, something else. But no, come on, it should be star for all for all hosts. So finally, we did a rollback. And after that, I knew that, oh, I wanted to show you one line of code. Do not use enumeration. I, I, I promise that's bad. I had enough reasons to not use that, but that was already on place. And this orange line is what I did. So apparently, when you call values, it generates a value set, which size depends on IDs. And that was a, like a moving from legacy system to this new one, and it had bit mask, and it wasn't exactly room type, but something like that. So, and the size of that value set is the difference between the highest uh, ID and the smallest. So it, it was something around four megabytes. And you would traverse through four megabyte structure for each request. So of course CPU was too busy doing that job. So, and I knew that Expedia has that process, correction of errors, a meeting, and I need to do a report. And honestly, I thought I was done. That's it, they're gonna fire me. My glorious time half a year at Expedia has ended on that Friday. I was like, that's it, I'm done. So of course I worked over weekend because it wasn't obvious what happened. Because I had unit tests, unit tests said it was all right, but it wasn't. And I was like, come on, what, what can go wrong? It was even static, I think. So you wouldn't do values on each call. Anyway, it was too big. So I had a fear again. What do I say when I come to that meeting? They probably will book a flight at Expedia and send me back to Siberia. <laughs> Maybe they won't because it's broken. <laughs> But anyway, I, I was terrified. I thought about they will blame me and I'll go there and they will be like, shame, shame, shame. 
<laughs> and I'm like, yes, enumerations are bad, <sighs> for sure. And then I came there and I started my, they gave me a template, like you should describe what problem was and you should give a timeline where it starts, why you didn't roll back in three minutes, why it took 15 minutes for you and things like that and then give the root cause. And it's a uh, meeting with skip level of my skip level. So big, big people are there. And I'm like, how do I explain this problem to non-technical people at all? <laughs> so I came there and I started, you know, enumerations, bit set, blah, blah, blah. And that was the first time actually when I presented in English too, outside of my team, I mean. So that was the nervous part, but it, it didn't bother me as much as the fact that they will fire me, right? So I started mumbling and they were like, why are we here? And I was like, because, oh my God, because of this. So, and at that moment, I realized that actually nobody was going to fire me, apparently. That wasn't the goal of the meeting. The atmosphere was trustful and sincere, and these people were wondering what went wrong, not because they want to shame you, not because they wanted to shame me, but because they wanted to come up with a plan how to prevent that from happening. And yeah, this is a template, find the root cause. And that template uh, <coughs> contained one important thing, questions which set the mood for the whole meeting. So you have, what's, what's happening? You have this section with five whys. You start with a question, answer that. Your next question is based on the answer of the previous one. So, and you start to explain them. Like, why did the system degrade? Well, because I deployed a change on Friday and uh, the CPU went 100% and uh, we couldn't roll back that from the first time. So why did the change cost CPU to go to 100%? Well, because I used something I shouldn't have used. Uh, why test did not catch that? because it wasn't a correctness problem, it was a performance problem. And here, the important detail is that we didn't have performance tests in place because that was a new system and it was uh, developing with such a pace that you just uh, are not keeping up with your performance test. I've seen Gatlin is our sponsor and so at that time we were using Scala 2.12, I think, and Gatlin was 2.11, so it took some time to have a separate, mod separate project run it across. So I think at that time we didn't have performance tests at all because of that problem. Someone wanted to move to 2.12 and Gatlin tests stopped work, stopped working. Anyway, that's what I explained it to people. And this, uh, pattern that you are asking question also uh, make the atmosphere different so people feel welcome to ask questions and you can put more details and everyone is just trying to find what action items you can do like why didn't we write performance test as I answered that already why did it take so long to roll back well because they are not automated and you know, I went out from that meeting happy. I wasn't fired. And also, I was given such an interesting, I was assigned to such an interesting task. I needed to write performance tests. I needed to change our pipeline so that we would have uh, canary deployments or something which will show in one host that there is a problem. And I was happy with, with that because that will indeed improve our process and we will indeed prevent of having same issues in the future. And I think without having this five eyes, it would be harder 
to find the way how to, how to uh, dig into the problem. So this, this is the uh, short recommendation. Just uh, do that step by step. Do not jump to the conclusion. Uh, base statements on fact and knowledge. No assumptions are allowed in um, answers. And never leave human error or blame John. that gives you an atmosphere, a welcoming questioning culture. Well, is retrospective fun? Three, two, one. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Before I tried, I, I thought that's a little bit boring and extroverts go ahead and, you know, sound louder than I do. No, I'm extrovert, but anyway. I was afraid that not everyone in my team is heard as good as others just because they are not vocal. And this is three questions that everyone wants to answer during their retro. You probably know them. But I found this funny uh, tool, Fun Retro, where you can uh, comment on each of the question anonymously and then vote for them. And that works very well for everyone. You can answer questions, ask questions here, and nobody will know who did that. So you can say, Paul joined the team, cool. And then everyone votes for that. But it's just a recommendation of how to uh, answer and question effectively. So the last part is uh, networking. What is your favorite track at conferences? Three, two, one. I cannot hear you, people. Three, two, one. Yes, I'm so happy that <laughs> people answered that. Hallway tracks, that's us talking to each other in the hallway. That's my favorite track at any conference I've been to. So I do encourage everyone to come and ask questions. But, well, here I need to stop and say, stay professional. No questions like, can I buy you a drink are appropriate. Sometimes people ask, by the way. I have another question for you. What is the first name of this person? Three, two, one. Martin. Cool. Correct answer. You came prepared, so come prepared. To make that comfortable at any conference, you need to talk to people, to communicate to them. And probably the easiest way is to approach speaker because you already know what they're passionate about, what they're talking, but come prepared. Do not ask the same question every time. I am a podcaster and I do ask a lot of questions during my interview. And that's very important part for me to be prepared, to ask questions that the guest is, cares about at the moment. It probably doesn't make sense to ask Martin about uh, generics in Java that he, <laughs> that he, he, he wrote, probably too late. We can ask about Dottie, of course, but he doesn't know my friend probably, so it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Another important part is listening. Whenever I prepare my interview and talk to my guest, I do spend a lot of time of listening. And I do pay attention to every detail they're saying because only that way the conversation will sound natural. Because you probably don't want to listen to a podcast where they ask question after question after question and they are not together, just something artificial. Same thing with the, uh, just the conversation in the hallway. Because I'm asking, I'm, I'm talking about questions, but listening to answer is also important. And for speakers, dear speakers, 
Uh, I want to recommend having time for Q&A session always. I want to recommend you having something online that like the link that I prepared in advance so that people would feel comfortable to ask questions. It's always feeling like you're a speaker for that 33 seconds when you're asking a question. And because you put yourself in front of the audience, in front of the speaker, you hold the mic, you feel like, oh, this is my 30 seconds of fame. <laughs> I, I need to look smart. What do I ask? And I found a study and apparently women ask half as less questions as men, proportionally, proportionally, which is disappointed. Dear ladies, I do expect you to ask me questions today. Are you listening to me? Three, two, one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I just said you need to listen. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no. What? Oh. And the last part is ask, asking for help. This is really hard. Like, really. Especially if you are known as an expert in your company. It's really hard to ask questions. Or to ask for help. So, I want briefly to show you by example how to do that. So as a solutions architect, I work a lot with new code bases. I deploy to uh, our clients' projects and I need to figure out and do audition in a very limited time. In like one week, I should say, hey, you're doing this right, you're doing this wrong, you should do this, you should do that. But also I, I have this interviewing process. I'm interviewer as well because I'm talking, I, I need to figure out the level of their developers. I'm, collaborating a lot, networking, and all this stuff. Ask a lot of questions, tons of them. But also I do work with big, uh, huge code bases. And I want to do that professionally. So I figure out that there are metrics, but most of them are object-oriented metrics. Of course, you can estimate the size of the project uh, with a uh, number of lines of code. This, this is the rough estimation or things like weighted method class, how many methods do you have per class or depths of inheritance. But a lot of these metrics do not make sense for functional programming. Or there are beautiful uh, visualization tools like this one. For example, here we can see that maximum complexity uh, is bigger than the one that expected, the, the, the one that normal or average complexity is less than expected. So you know as a solutions architect or like someone who's reviewing that you should pay attention to this. Or you can look at the code coverage heat map and t t test coverage heat map and say, hey, you have black holes here. You need to write some unit tests. Please do. And this is a nice way to look from a distance to a project because I do not have time to, you know, look at the every micro level line of code. As a, as a developer, I used to do that. I know syntax very well, it's easy to read, but I just don't have enough time. And this is my favorite one. You can build a city based on your project. Each building or each block is your package, each building is a class and uh, the Every floor in the building is your public method, so you can figure it out easily where controllers are because they're huge skyscrapers. If you have a lot of them, oh, you have a problem, Houston. So all of this is for Java world, and we don't have anything for Scala. And even though I was thinking about that, but I need you help guys because I need to come up what is a good FP metric for Scala and what is a good visualization. <coughs> so please come to me and talk to me if you have ideas about that or please comment online. My DMs on Twitter are open. 
And I would love to have discussion about that and maybe eventually have a talk about that, how to work with huge Scala database, databases, um, yeah, code bases. <laughs> yes, and finally, I want you to have one takeaway from this talk. It's questioning culture. I do encourage you, everyone, to make it comfortable at work everyone to ask questions when they need to, everyone to ask for help when they need to. And as I promised before, I have questions for you prepared so that you could ask. So ladies, if you don't know what to ask, that's for you. We also have questions online, I believe. And before we move to Q&A session, I have the last question for you. How many questions did I ask? Three, two, one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>